I spent most of my army life, our Indian army life, on the frontier, away from my regiment, seconded to Frontier Corps, uh, which of course is not Sikh at all, it's uh, a Muslim PMs, uh, Bataan rather. And at the end of my tour there, I was naturally, as, as things go, I was then posted back to my regimental centre, which was at Nashera at that time. And there I met uh, Tom Dykes, who was the second in command, uh, second to the commandant there. I hadn't met Tom before. Uh, I knew he would, he'd been in the 4th Battalion. I'd heard about him. And there they were. We lived close to them. Uh, they backed upon our, our bungalow compound. And there we were uh, at that time. I wasn't there very long. I didn't get to know Tom well. I wasn't actually working with him or near him. I knew him because he was a, a member of the center, but my work took me away from him, from his work to a great extent. What did he look like? Tom, erect, uh, soldierly of course, uh, very strict in his manner and his work. He didn't suffer fools gladly. Uh, I, what little I knew of him, uh, wasn't altogether too happy because on one occasion he, uh, I met him when we were out walking one afternoon in the evenings we used to walk round. It was very hot, of course, at that time. And the order was that one should wear a certain dress which uh, kept, which avoided mosquitoes, those long trousers, for instance. Well, I'd been out some time and I still had my shorts in from, uh, my shorts on from um, the morning's uh, exercises. And he took exception to this and we, uh, I didn't, of course, dare answer him back. He was not, in fact, uh, of a rank senior to me, but uh, when he was second in command, and you don't uh, naturally argue with such people. It doesn't do your report any good. Anyhow, that uh, came off all right, and I understood what the trouble was, and uh, uh, that was more or less our first meeting, and so uh, we didn't have very much conversation after that. I knew him from a distance, tallish, uh, as I was, as I said, very strict in his, in his interpretation of, 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 of uh, uh, what should be done each day. Um, came from the 4th Battalion and had been involved with the 4th Battalion in their fighting in various theatres. Uh, very good at that, very good reputation. He served uh, in Burma, I think. A big one. He served in Burma. Uh, yes, that would have been in, if you said, he, he did in fact, I think that's so. Now the 4th Battalion didn't actually go to Burma, they were in the Middle East the whole of the war. But it's quite possible that he happened to be moved to one of the regimental battalions in Burma because they may have been short of officers and they wanted uh, an extra officer perhaps of his kind of age and seniority. And that's frequently happened. We moved about, within our regiment, we moved about between battalions quite a lot. I re yes. If at almost your first meeting he reprimanded you for a very minor misdemeanor, it does suggest he wasn't a, a great people person. A great people person. He wasn't somebody who, who people warmed to. Uh, well, I don't think, I think you're right there. Um, I don't trust my own feeling in that respect because I was being reprimanded. Well, naturally, I felt, uh, as one would, a slight animosity at uh, being called to attention, not in the presence of many other people. In fact, Marguerite was the only other person who happened to be there at the time. Had there been others there, I have no doubt he would have perhaps moderated and sent for me the following morning to say, look here, you shouldn't have been dressed in that way. Yes, I, I think perhaps that is so. He was um, a rather severe man, perhaps, in those ways. Can you give me any idea of why a young man such as yourself or Tom Dykes would wish to enrol and become an officer in the Indian Army in the late 30s? Uh, yes. In Tom's case... I don't know, but obviously he was well fitted for the profession that he had chosen. I, I don't know whether his family 
had been involved with the army or Indian army or any other military occupation before. In my own case, I was always, from boyhood, keen on the military side. I'm an enthusiastic member of my officer's training corps at school. And I happened also to have friends from school days who'd gone on, older friends, who'd gone on to the Indian Army, and they had known my elder brothers, and they'd come to home, to our home, to stay during their leave and that kind of thing. And they both uh, had uh, had said, well, look, if you're, uh, if you're really rather doubtful about what you want to do in life, um, and you're keen militarily, well, come along and join our regiment. I didn't, in fact, in the end, join the regiment of either of theirs because I at Sandhurst I was persuaded to go to um, the Sikh regiment. Why? Uh, sorry? Why the Sikh regiment? Well, um, the one of the instructors uh, at Sandhurst, all the instructors except the very senior ones, were drawn in for a period, uh, a tour, with at Sandhurst as instructors. And it happened that there were one or two from the Sikh regiment at that time and I was sent for one evening by one of the majors who was an instructor, a Sikh regiment. He said, um, well, now, um, what regiment are you going to? So I said, well, I'd thought of the, I was having, I'd thought of the Queen's Regiment, Queen's Royal West Surrey in those days, because I happened to live in Surrey and I knew where their barracks were and one thing or another. Uh, or perhaps um, I might think of going to Gurkhas. And he said, well, look, why don't you think about the uh, Sikh regiment? And that's how it started. What was life like in Noshera in the spring and summer of 1947, your last few months in India? I think probably very much as it had been before, but rather more hectic because people were coming and going fairly quickly. It was the end of the war, uh, the partition was on the way, and a number were getting ready to go home, more were coming in for posting to various other places, but there wasn't much posting going on for the British personnel because, of course, we were all then, at our age, which would be about 26, 27 then, we were all going to be shot back home again. Well, you say you were all going to be shot back home again, and you came back, I think you were saying in July 1947, but Tom chose to stay on. He was still there and still in active, well, still a, a member of his regiment in October when he was killed. Why would Tom have chosen to stay on? Well, it's probably what he opted to do. And <clears throat> not all British officers came back at the same time because they had, of course... Uh, positions in their various regiments, and those positions had to be filled by Indians. Now there was a shortage of India of trained officers, Indian trained officers. However, that was being um, that was being gradually uh, put right, corrected that term. And so some officers stayed on rather longer than others, depending to a large extent upon their age, I think. Those of my own age, about 27 at the time, we were, we could be, uh, our, our slots could be filled quite quickly. So we didn't have to wait around. But those who were older did wait for a certain longer for some suitable Indian to take their position. Or, in some cases, they were offered uh, short contracts, one, two, three year contracts to stay with the Indian, stay with their regiment, uh, and then uh, could choose then when they wanted to go home. And Tom, uh, being good reputation, well reported on, I don't know whether he was asked to stay or offered to stay, but he certainly did stay a bit longer. Mind you, uh, the difference when he was killed what was October, what, October 47? Um, that was only really about four or five months after we'd gone. So it's not altogether uh, a very long time to stay on. Do you remember hearing about his death? Yes, but it wasn't till later. Uh, I don't know why. I really, I really can't recall exactly when I did hear about this, but.
But I don't think it was while I was at while I was at uh, Nashera. I think it's we had gone. We knew we, we uh, as I said, we'd gone already, and it must have been in UK that we heard about this. But doubtless, I think probably uh, probably Marguerite will be able to tell you more about that. The first Sikhs spearheaded the Indian military operation in the Kashmir Valley, trying to repulse the raiders, and indeed the the spearhead of their uh, military operation were killed near Baramulla within hours of Colonel Dykes. Did you hear any speculation among former members of the regiment about exactly what had happened? No, I don't. I've heard nothing about that. There's a certain amount been written about it, and it does appear that maybe there was a certain amount of confusion. Uh, there were a number of casualties, Sikh casualties, certainly, and you may perhaps have heard of uh, a member, uh, uh, an NCO of the of the first battalion, that is Lance Corporal, um, uh, uh, <coughs> well, uh, Lance Nike, as, as you probably know, it <coughs> Nan Singh VC, who did extremely well in Burma, captured three Japanese trenches on his own. He was um, up there at the forefront of his battalion in the um, with the uh, the insurrection t- time. And poor old chap, in spite of his uh, extreme bravery, he uh, stood up at the wrong moment, received a, 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 a light machine gun um, burst in the chest, which killed him immediately. Poor old um, Lance Nike Nun Singh, or Nike by then, because he'd been promoted, of course, um, in view of his, uh, his VC. No, I, I don't know much about that, but it's been discussed over and over again. But I think there may have been, perhaps little bit of confusion at that time. Mrs Souter, when did you meet uh, Biddy first? I didn't meet Biddy until I joined Ben in Nashira, and to our amazement we found that our bungalows backed onto each other in Nashira, but while we were each waiting for our sea passage out to join our husbands, in Nashira. She had been living with her sister just about 200 yards down the road from where I was living with my mother waiting for passages. And so we had a lot to talk about and we laughed about it so much because Biddy went out with two small children which must have been quite a a difficulty for her with no help. And had I met her at home in England I could have applied to go out with her to help her with the children but that wasn't to be. But once I had met her in Nashira, I got on with her extremely well. She she was a person with a round, happy, jolly face, and she was very motherly, and she was devoted to her children, and to Tom, of course, and I was very happy to go and help her uh, entertain the children or look after them. We each, of course, had the usual range of domestic staff of local Indians. Um, I use that term Indian in, in, in the sense before division happened. And they came from various nations and tribes and whatever and all lived happily together. All of us had staff quarters in our bungalow compounds and none of them lived in our houses, but they all lived happily together at the bottom of the garden, as it were. We didn't have a built-in kitchen in the house because we each had a cook, a consumer who worked in a shed at the bottom of the garden, and we each had a bearer who acted as a sort of butler at dinner parties, and it was not unusual to find your own cutlery or your own glass or your own serving dishes on your neighbour's dinner table when you were invited to dinner there. So there was a great family feeling between the various groups of staff. Uh, Biddy, of course, had an ayah, uh, an Indian lady, to, who was specifically to look after the children. But Biddy, I think, was very keen to keep them... Uh, um, very anglicised and not to get too Indianized, and um, as I had been as a child. And so we worked together quite a lot and I got to know the children, particularly the younger one, Douglas, little Dougie I always called him. And then when it came about that she was pregnant and 
we had planned that all the families go up to Baramulla anyway in the hot weather because the extremes of climate in Naushira were quite fantastic. Um, icy winds and twin sets in January, but by July you were absolutely sweltering and couldn't walk outside in the sun without protection. The children were put to bed during that time because they were up early in the morning and in the cool of the evening. And we had planned that I should go up to Baramulla with Biddy to help her with, with the children when the third baby was born. But in the meantime, partition had come about and as I had no children, I was the one that was sent home with my husband and we had traveled down to Bombay or near Bombay to be in a holding camp waiting for a passage. And I can't tell you what that, how awful that was. You had absolutely nothing to do all day long except go to the office, find out if your turn had come up for a passage. Otherwise, you had absolutely nothing to do all day. I think it must be very similar to being in a refugee camp. It, it's quite awful, I can tell you, until your turn came for a passage. And by that time, the monsoon was due to arrive and the weather was terribly oppressive and depressing. But anyway, Biddy went up to Baramulla with the children where it was cooler and more comfortable, we thought. And I was very resentful that I'd arrived in India in January and I had to leave in June or July. And Ben had planned so many expeditions for us. We had planned to go to Chitral. I never got to Kashmir that I'd heard so much about. The furthest I ever got to was Bashar. And I had to turn around and go home before I'd done any of those things. I felt very angry about it. And I was very annoyed that I wasn't allowed to go with Biddy up to Baramulla and see that side of life. But there it was. And I think possibly one of the reasons for Tom accepting a, a whatever he accepted to stay on longer was because of the impending birth of the third baby that suited them better to do it that way. And um, I didn't hear, I remember, I don't remember exactly hearing, but I know we were back in England, it must be in October, before we heard about it, and I don't remember exactly when it happened. It was in October, I believe, wasn't it? The end of October, yes. End of October. I think we must have heard about it fairly soon, but I was back in England by that time. Life in Oshera, in one way, it must have been idyllic with so much help and such a lovely surrounding. On the other hand, it must have been really quite difficult, especially for, for army wives. It must have been very alien, very lonely. It could have been lonely had we not all got together and shared all sorts of things. Um, I had time on my hands because I had no children, uh, but I had to organise the the staff, the, the servants, and Ben got a teacher in to teach me Urdu. So I forget how often, I think that was about twice a week, and I had homework to do. He was a fascinating man, the, the Munchi he was called, and the English lesson consisted of, him, of me describing to him what life was like in England. One of the things he could not understand was the underground system in London. Where did the air come from and all this sort of thing. And that was how I learnt what Urdu I did learn. It was rather classical Urdu and I remember when I tried it out on the gardener, he wasn't um, the Mali, he wasn't understanding a word I was saying because he spoke some other kind of uh, language which wasn't Urdu that I was learning. Um, I used to sit and do a lot of embroidery. I'd gone out with materials and cottons and things and every now and again I used to lose one or two and after a few weeks I remember the bearer coming to Ben and saying that uh, his daughter wished to meet me. And so this little girl appeared and she brought the most beautifully embroidered cotton dressing gown for me with a lot of Indian embroidery all over it. And it really was lovely. And when I went to, to put it on, I realised that many of my embroidery threads were incorporated in this wonderful gift that I had received. 
So appropriating little things were not exactly stealing. It was their way of life somehow, and one couldn't object to it because it was presented to me in, in such a wonderful way. And I remember when we left Nigeria to get the train down to Bombay, all our staff were lined up on the railway platform to say goodbye to us. And there were a few tears, and I felt very concerned about them because partition was taking place, and there we'd had all this staff living very happily, peacefully together in almost a family unit while still keeping to our own cultures. And I wondered what would happen to them after we had gone. Of course, I never heard. We never knew. But I think some of them must have been slaughtered very soon after we left. Biddy, give me a, a pen portrait. What did she, a word portrait of Biddy, what did she look like? She, as I remember her, it's a long time ago, she had a, a round, happy face, um, a darkish hair and a lovely smile. I think her smile, and she always seemed to be smiling. And she was a very motherly mother and she was very devoted to Tom because they'd been separated so much. And I think there must have been times when she just did not know what had happened to him, possibly. So they were very, very united family. And I think they kept themselves to themselves. I don't remember Tom and Biddy being part of the parties that we used to have in the evenings. We'd either collect in the grounds of the mess or we'd move on to somebody else's house. Uh, or we'd go down to the swimming pool. There was a swimming pool which belonged to a British regiment down the road. Um, I don't remember them taking part in any of those parties. They were very tightly knit group themselves and kept themselves to themselves, although Biddy always made me feel extremely welcome. What are your memories of Tom? I don't remember meeting Tom in his own home because we wives were always very sure to be at home ready for when our husbands came home from whatever they were doing. But uh, meeting him on one occasion when Ben and I were out for a walk, he was a very commanding presence and rather severe looking, but very good looking with it, I remember, a very fine looking man. And a strong silent man, I think, is the answer to that one. A fisherman, I understand. I didn't know that. The children, what did the children do? What did Tom and, and little Dougie do in Nashara? Well, they were little boys and they played a lot of imaginary games. Uh, Dougie was a bit uh, reticent. He used to, rather than, than join in Tom's games, he would prefer to sit on my lap and watch what was going on if they were playing imaginary games with their... I don't remember them having soldiers. Perhaps Tom didn't allow them to play with soldiers. I remember soft toys, dogs and tigers and things of that sort. And I remember them playing tigers in the jungle. And it was then that little Dougie came and sat on my knee because tigers were rather frightening. Although he enjoyed being frightened as long as he was safe with me or with Biddy. Um, and uh, again, I should think he would be similar to Tom, similar to his father, in that he was, I think he's much more of the strong, silent type. And uh, the older brother, Tom, was much more outgoing and very much more lively. That's what, how I remember them. What did they call you? I think they called me Auntie. I don't really remember that. I think it was Auntie as far as I remember. Do you remember saying goodbye to Biddy? Was that when you came back or was that when she went to Um, I think we, I think I left before she did. And I, I don't particularly remember the specific moment of saying goodbye, but I do remember the moment we realised that I was not going to be allowed to go with her up to Baramulla. So I think I left on the train before she left for Baramulla, as far as I remember. You say you remember that moment. What do you remember of it? Great disappointment on my part, and I don't know what Biddy felt. Perhaps she was a bit sorry that she wasn't going to have my companionship of the similar sort of age, but she was a very resourceful person, and 
I believe she'd been there before to Boromola, and so she knew the nuns and she knew that she would be in very caring surroundings. So she couldn't, none of us could have had any slightest idea that there was any danger of her going up to Boromola. Did she talk about the convent at all? Not that I can remember. When you heard about her death, how did you feel? Absolutely ghastly, absolutely unbelievable. And at the time, if you you hear that they've been killed under those under very nasty circumstances, but the real horror of it only struck when we heard more details of the killing much later on. And it's never been out of my mind. And I think there was we were friendly with the General Maservi and his wife. And when I heard that they were taking care of the children, I felt a little bit, a uh, bit of relief. But I think ever since then, really not uh, a year has gone by without me having thought, I wonder what's happened to those boys. I wonder where they are now. I wonder how they are. And all these years, I've never forgotten them as a family and the ghastly circumstances of their deaths. Um, do you mind if I show you a photograph? It's a photograph I got from, uh, from Doug. Oh, right. Uh, yes. so let me... Um, <coughs> this, this is... Um, <coughs> sorry. There was a girl, wasn't there? One died in Aden. Was that right all the way back? Yes, now that was the... That this, uh, let me show you this photograph, which I've got from one of Tom and Biddy's sons. Now, he thinks this is a photograph of their wedding. In Delhi. Uh, in Agra. In Agra, rather. Yes, I've seen this. I've seen this before. Um, is that Tom? Yes. I would say that was, and that's Biddy. That's Biddy. And there's Biddy. Yes, yes. It's a little, little, and a round face, dark mm. hair. and very smiley, although she's not smiley there. Do you recognise anybody else from that photograph? I'm looking to see. Now, Thomas Best Man... Wasn't his name Baxter? Baxter, John Baxter. Died about a couple of years ago. That's right. He'd been a major, he'd got uh, riding breeches on. I'm, um, I'm a bit, um, at the moment, ah, that's, that's the one for you. I uh, haven't got my glasses, I've got some new ones being, new glasses being made, and in the meantime, <laughs> I've got to wear some old ones, which of course are not really, not awfully good. But that's I seem to, to recognise the little man with the moustache and glasses, but I can't think who it is. Which one? Next, standing next to Biddy. I, I can't focus at the moment until I've got these things. Thank you. Thanks so much. Let's have a look and see. This part will, 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 will do for the time. That's better. Do you like that? Ah, that is Baxter. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's Baxter, isn't this it? This is... I don't know. I don't... You see, I had... What, nearly five years away yes. uh, from my regiment on the, um, on the frontier. But which is Tom? Tom is there, and his best man That's here. Baxter with the moustache? Yes. That, as far as I know, um, I would say probably that uh, that would be Baxter, that one. But And this is a younger, this is a younger man. But I don't know who that might be. I'm not. I, I don't. Didn't know Baxter well, but I'm pretty sure that that is he. Now, Tom comes across as very tall. He must be what six one, six two. It I looks like him as that. Being very tall. Yes. And Biddy, even though she seems to be wearing high heels, looks about five one, five two at the most. Yes, she does. That's right. Yes, I'm five four. Mm. So if I thought of her as being small, she would have been about five one, five. See, there's somebody behind who is. European, two or three, two of them, two ladies. 
There must have been some of Biddy's contemporaries there that we wouldn't know. Did she ever talk about how she met her husband? No, I, I don't remember that we ever discussed that. Doug told me an intriguing story about how she was a nurse and she deliberately fell off her bike and exposed her legs, which were apparently rather shapely, to attract <laughs> Tom's attention. <laughs> she never told you that story. No, no, that's, no. That's, that's, I don't know that story. <laughs> when you see Tom and Biddy together in that photograph, from well, that photograph is 60 years old now, mm. what sort of sentiment does it uh, give rise to? What is the What sentiment? sort of sentiment? Days of the old Raj. Typical of the old Raj. Typical, because my family were all, uh, my, both sides of my family, both my parents. And there, I've seen so many photos of this type that it just seems very familiar. Yes. <clears throat> How do you look on your days in India? Do you look on them with happiness and affection? Oh, very much so. Yes. Oh yes. <clears throat> My days in, in in India. I mean, oh yes. Uh, I was naturally disappointed not to go overseas with my regiment, with my battalion. But then at that, at that time, I think I mentioned they were milking the old battalions of young officers to form the new ones, of which there were six or seven new battalions raised of different sorts. And I was disappointed in that, but I was. Uh, a little bit, um, I think, my last year or two with the with the Scots on the frontier were perhaps a bit tedious because I'd been there quite a long time, longer than usual, usual tours, or about three years, and not much was happening because uh, during the during the war, the government of India, of course, didn't want to be stabbed in the back by having an insurrection on the frontier while they were, all the troops were round the world, Malaya, Middle East, fighting for the, for, for the country. And so they increased in those days, during the war, they increased uh, <coughs> tribal um, money paid to tribes not to cause trouble. Uh, you might call it, you may remember in ancient history, uh, Danegeld. The Danes were paid not to come and invade England. This was the sort of exactly the, uh, the 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 equal idea. And you were dealing with people like the Fakir of Epi and people of that sort. Uh, that's right. Of course, Epi was then a back number. He had been just before my time. He had been right at the front of insurrection, but he was a bit of a back number then, and we didn't see him. Um, the extra money paid by the government kept them. Kept the kept the the tribes fairly quiet, and after 1941, 42, there was very little trouble there, except for the uh, the odd um, the meeting, the odd for a bit of sniping going on. Really, a little bit boring. Nothing like b b b pre-war, of course, where it was a a very good. The frontier was a very good training ground for b regular battalions of the Indian Army. They were sent up kept moving round, a cycle kept moving round, and there they got their frontier, their frontier warfare uh, initiation. Did you ever go to Kashmir? To? Kashmir. <coughs> oh, yes, several times. Always on holiday, on leave. It was from the frontier. We nearly all of us went straight on to Rolpindi, uh, take a taxi, Indian taxi, up to Kashmir, and stay in... The, the, the well-known Nidu's Hotel there, you may have heard of. I understand now it's long since been burnt to the ground. Mostly, mostly timber, mostly made of wood. Yes, I was up there a number of times, uh, sometimes shooting uh, for enjoyment of meeting people, uh, bathing in the lakes and so on. And I took a number of, quite a lot of photographs up there, including cine film too. Uh, which I still have has been. It's now been put on to uh, uh, video, a video uh, at the by the National Army Museum. Have done that for me, and I understand that it's it may or may not have been used for a television program, TV program, uh, coming up later this year called uh, India, 
India in pre-war in colour, something of uh, lead nature is coming up, and they may or may not have used some of my... They, they took all my cinefilm away, copied bits of it, and then, and then gave it back to... It's lodged permanently in the National Army Museum, who, who want these sort of things, any kind of things like that, uh, to be kept in their, uh, in, in their stores for um, a future reference for um, people writing books, anything of that kind, you see, information required. And my film is there. Nedu's Hotel in Kashmir, in Srinagar, in the... In the Sorry? Nedu's Hotel in the mid-40s. Yes. What sort of place was it? You hear lots of stories about life in Srinagar, suggesting that it was quite a riotous, raucous place for young army officers on leave. Um, I didn't... I, I, it wasn't as bad... No, it was very good. And, of course, it was just like a hotel. The building was uh, timber. It was an Indian type of, of building. Uh, the servants, of course, were all uh, Kashmiri, or Indian anyway. And uh, we never... There wasn't much noise and so on going on there. The, it was constantly changing... Uh, a young officer community because uh, you had a fortnight or perhaps a month's leave. You went up there and you went down again. More people came up and they went down again all the time. All the summer it was changing. Winter was very cold, but Nidu was in that case opened up in Gulmarg, which is way up, way up in the mountains above Sirilaga. And there there was there was plenty of skiing going on and I was there at least twice um, with my skiing there, um, no such things as lifts or anything like that. If you wanted to ski, if you wanted to ski downhill, you had to climb up the hill first to get to the top and then ski. Uh, skis in wartime, actual skis and sticks, were hard to come by. And I remember breaking at least two pairs through falling down and so on. And then the Kashmiri who ran the ski store up there, he very politely refused to loan me any more. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing. That was uh, very cold, but very cheerful. Did you ever go to Baramulla? Yes, I did. But never to stay, passing through, it was you, you to drive up to Kashmir, you had to go through Baramulla. That, that was the way the road went. Uh, I suppose we probably stopped off there for a drink or maybe a snack of some kind. But normally, when you got in your taxi in Pindi to go up to Sirilaga, you, you didn't stop uh, for only for a few minutes here and there. You went straight on up. It was a very long and uh, quite, a, quite a, an exciting journey with uh, an Indian taxi driver. How many hours? I would think between three and four that's not too bad. My memory not being... Uh, yes, it wasn't too bad, it depended. Some some people used to stop on the way. Uh, women folk, families, sometimes stopped on the way. I don't know if it was in Baramulla or another uh, town which one went through on the way, which was uh, Demail. Demail was the other town, I think. I went. I was in Demel last year. <laughs> I, I don't know whether you want to see them, but I brought photographs of the graves of the dancers. I'd love to see yep, anything that you've so. got, yes. yes indeed. Um, I noticed that you and practically everybody who goes out on holiday in these days pronounces Srinagar. But when we were out there, it was always Srinagar. Yes, I know, and I've asked local people about this. They're quite comfortable now with Srinagar to be the general sort of accepted oh, yeah. pronunciation, yeah. but people who, who know it from times past yes. do say Sri Nagar or... Srinagar, because yeah. Nagar was the Indian word for a, a, a gully, wasn't it? I, I think that's obviously the, the derivation of the name is, yes. is, is from two parts, yeah. Sri and yes. Yes. Nagar, yes. Uh, but I think that's... Yes. that's yes. But you're right, I think sort of whether we're just taking liberties these days or not, I don't know, but... The uh, other thing that we used to talk about... Um, Talking about um, Afghanistan, Kabul, which oh. everybody is saying Kabul. Ka yeah. Well, we <laughs> said we said the world say we say Kabul. Kabul. Kabul is the correct pronunciation. Yes. Well, it's, it's the way the locals Long say it. But, yes. Uh, yes. And uh, K A B K Long A B L. Kabul is the way it was. Said. But the old days, Kabul was the word used. Kabul. Toria, are all photo had, albums um, down at the back the, there? The only, only a journalist, the only announcer that it's I've ever heard. Table who pronounced it correctly, well, was, as we say correctly, Corbel, was a French 
journalist right. up there, a girl. <laughs> and she actually said Corbel. And then later corrected herself and said Kabul, <laughs> which is worse. <laughs> that was some time ago. But let me show you these these photographs. Some of the, some of these are, are family ones which won't be of any interest to you, but this this is the graveyard at the back of the convent in in Barramulla. And that military grave is Tom's grave. Mm -hmm. And then three away, that's Biddy's grave. Now, as it was explained to me, they didn't immediately find Biddy's body, body because it was... Was it in the well, bottom it, of the it well? It was down a well in the convent mm -hmm. grounds. Mm -hmm. So um, she was buried a couple of days after the rest. Mm -hmm. And there was a nun killed as well, a sixth person, and she's in yeah, a yeah. separate graveyard. Who, who are these other two? There's... Um, now, there's, that's Mr. Barreto. He was the... Um, husband of the convent doctor who was a Goan woman he was killed when he tried to stop the raiders um, attacking Miss Philomena was a nurse and then a Hindu a woman patient was also killed mm. with a sister so there were six dead altogether yes. was the, uh, the Lashkar that did this the Lashkar was a, as, as one knows, a, a gang um, were from, uh, from the frontier Marsoud's uh, probably some was here swearing into the kind of chaps who would uh, hear about the possibility of loot and uh, pick up their rifles and go straight off. But these are the sort of people that you were working with for, for a few years. Uh, well, they were the local inhabitants, not the army, not, not the scouts, so the frontier scouts. They wouldn't do that. But the local, the local people who lived in Waziristan, and the same people now who are called um, Pashtuns, Pashtuns in uh, Afghanistan. They're all the same people, and they are the ones who caused the trouble with, with uh, EP, you see. But were you based in Waziristan at all? Yes. Oh, yes. In, in, Waziristan is, um, was divided into, into territories, into um, uh, regions, and I was part of the South Waziristan. The North Waziristan called themselves the Tochi Scouts, which you probably know. The most well-known of all is of the Tochi Scouts. Then there were minor, uh, the uh, Joe Militia, which was up on the North Frontier, never had any trouble at all. And <clears throat> the but the locals there were Wazirs in North Waziristan and Masouds in South Waziristan. And a certain amount of mixing, too, because they were all Bataan. And they spoke... Um, Pashto, the same as our men did, but with slightly different... The accent was very much the same, but some of the... They had some strange words which were interesting, and we came across these. Did you know Frank Leeson, who was...? Yes, yes. Not there, not, in, uh, not, not up there, because he started uh, his tour up there with a uh, Khazadar uh, officer, as he was called. A very interesting uh, occupation. Uh, that started just at the time when I was leaving Scots to go back to my regiment again. So I never actually met him up there. But since then, of course, he has written accounts, which I've read, and I met him first uh, last year, uh, and he has... I've got a book of his... Uh, he's lent me here his, uh, his diary, illustrated diary of his time there. And I also found out that he was commissioned uh, originally into the Sikh regiment, but in fact, he volunteered for the uh, frontier job almost as soon as he joined his the, the regiment. So we never knew him there. I knew him because I, he happened to be up there at the time. Although I never met him, and I've seen him since. And we are in contact with uh, with Frankly Francis, properly in fact, his name. Uh, and uh, I hope he's coming to our reunion lunch in October again. So he's both a member of the Scouts reunion group and also the Regiment of the Sikhs as well. And which is the reunion? That's of the Scouts or the Sikhs? The, 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 the place? Um, no, the, the, the reunion you mentioned in October, is that a Scouts reunion or a Sikh reunion? Now that, there are two, and they're both in October. The one in early October is a Scouts reunion, and that's run by, not by me, but by somebody else. And uh, it doesn't include, unfortunately, it is a man own, men only reunion, so wives don't go to that. It takes place in the same hotel on the outskirts of Salisbury, uh, which is an, a, 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 a focal point for some other regiments as well, who run, uh, who go for lunch there. 
Uh, early October, Scouts reunion there, and late October, then the Sikh regimental reunion, which is a something that I that I look after, having been uh, secretary of the Scouts of the Sikh regimental association um, for about eight nine years now. What sort of attendance do you get these days? Twenty, eighteen, twenty. Mostly the same same people. A few new ones, one or two new ones every year, but otherwise you're meeting old friends again. Just this is this is a, a close up of uh, Tom Dykes's grave. You can see the uh, the inscription there, and it is actually listed as a war grave. It's the only war grave, British or Commonwealth oh, war grave right. in in Kashmir. Oh, that says also his wife, Biddy, there. Yes, though, in fact, she's, she's buried just a, a couple well, of graves. Maybe they didn't find that was written before they discovered her. I think that because it was a war grave, they wanted to mention her on the official war right, grave rather yes, than just leave yes. it to the uh, the informal grave that was put uh, up. So his wife, Biddy, goes... Um, would you... I mean, you've got... up. To, we're only relying on, on memory. Um, would you recount the actual incident of the death as you've discovered it. Yeah. We started the thought by saying what you thought the purpose of the Masoods and Wiziris going to Kashmir would have been in their own mind. Um, yes, this was uh, this was a lashka of looters. Uh, a lashka being a, a, a gang or, um, or party on the warpath. And they would be in search of loot. They would be Masoods, Wiziris and other Bud marshes, that's bad lots, as you might say, from the frontier. The sort of people that you knew quite well, because you'd been based in the frontier for several years. The, these are people who, yes, indeed, uh, these are the local inhabitants in Wazirastan who took any opportunity of um, <coughs> using their, picking up their rifles and going to shoot up, um, preferably the army, because it was a softer touch than the scouts were. Uh, the scouts were, were, with whom I was serving were the, the same kind, Patans again, uh, albeit living in British India for the most part, uh, and we, uh, our job was to keep a, a check on these, uh, on these Lushkas uh, during war. And having said that, this Lushka would have been uh, hard, going hard for, for Seralaga, for Kashmir, in order to, for, to loot things. They'd have shot anybody who got in the way. Now, I can see Tom, typical of a British officer, and I think I hope I might have done the same thing as well, saw these, heard about these chaps and said, oh, the are go outside and stop these fellows, in a way that one has, that a British officer could usually do in India. Go out and unarmed and say, look here, stop this nonsense, and people would stop. Now, this didn't work in Tom, I'm afraid, at Baramullah. The Lashka was on the trail of route, and they weren't going to stop for anybody. Tom may not, uh, undoubtedly, was not dressed in uniform, so he'd not have been recognised as a, as a member of the British Army, um, British Indian Army there. And you can see these uh, Lushka, a lot of young chaps, um, very enthusiastic and uh, with their, their arms in their hands, and any one of them, possibly more, would have upped his rifle and shot him on the spot. I understand they they were shot mostly in the stomach, as to say, probably shot quickly, and um, um, <clears throat> disposed of at once because they were seen to be in the way. And that's, I think, probably in Tom's mind. I will behave as a British officer, and I'll go outside and talk to these chaps, and 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 get them stopped. And it, well, it just didn't work in that case. What would the Masood and Waziri's attitude of, to women have been, especially Western women? When they came across Western women, what would their attitude have been? You'd probably leave them aside because they were not... They didn't normally shoot women unless it happened that uh, uh, that woman, if any, would, was trying, was opposing them in some way. Well, Biddy obviously was not doing that. In this case, she went out because she had seen her husband harmed, and she went out to, to go to his side. And they, just having shot Tom, uh, probably may have thought that she was um, opposing them in some way, or just because she was in the wave of loot and was shot her at once. Thank you.